Our next guest, Sue Charman Anderson, is a journalist and software consultant. And Sue, there you are. You're going to talk about why we are so obsessed with our email and what we can do about it. Please welcome Sue Charman Anderson. Hello. Um, thank you. Uh, right. So I'm a social media consultant. Um, I've been working for about the last six years in the field of social media, um, back when we used to call it blogging. Um, and one of the things that has fascinated me over this time is, is how we relate to our email, how we relate to our inbox. And um, Excuse me a moment. And um, I think one of the issues is that you know we don't necessarily think about how we, um, why we behave the way that we do when we're using our email. So I want to just um, cover a few things that kind of start off really with an all-star uh, cast. Um, starting off looking at, at rats and the role of dopamine in rat behavior. Um, we're also going to take a look at uh, the way that you train African crested cranes uh, and then take a look at what all this means for email. So um, our all-star cast starts off with uh, B.F. Skinner, who was an American psychologist in the 50s. Um, a rat, or more importantly, his rat, a cage, some food, and a lever. All of these things incredibly important in understanding email, particularly when they are put together in this. This is what is known as a Skinner box. And what B.F. Skinner did was that he put rats in this cage, and they discovered that if they bumped into um, a bar, which you can just see there, that a food pellet would be delivered. And the rats very quickly learnt that hitting the bar meant food. So they started to push that bar, push that pedal, in order to stockpile food. This is known as operant conditioning. And this operant conditioning happens in every creature that is capable of learning. So that includes us we also get conditioned to carry out certain behaviors when those behaviors are rewarded. So what we discovered, what B.F. Skinner discovered, is that rats can count. So if a rat gets rewarded after pressing the bar four times, and they get rewarded again after another four presses and another, they kind of put four and four and four together and have a little epiphany and go, oh, right, OK. If I push the lever four times, then I'm going to get a reward. But what happens if you change that, if you add in randomness? Well, this is something that Skinner did. He added, added in randomness so that the rat may have gotten a, a reward after four presses the first time round, but after the next four, there's nothing. And then after another press, there's still nothing. And then after six presses, there's something. And they're kind of slightly confused. And then they get another um, reward after two presses. And then they're really confused. And so what happens is that the rat can no longer see a relationship between the behavior of pushing the bar and the re reward getting the food. So the rat can't establish a rhythm. What happens in this case is that the rat then starts to obsess with pushing the bar, pushing the lever, and getting the food. They don't pace themselves anymore. Um, they just get obsessed. And to the point of actually pushing the bar and ignoring the food. So they're not even now focusing on the fact that they can eat their reward. Given a choice between a regular scheduled lever and a random lever, the rats chose random every time. The random reward was more rewarding. This is the same uh, process that's involved in gambling. It's the same mechanism. And at the moment, the understanding is that dopamine is what is 
uh, driving this. Dopamine causes a seeking behavior. So whether you're seeking food or whether you're seeking uh, a reward on a slot machine, um, this is kind of unavoidable behavior. It is fundamental to the way that our brains work. So this is not really about sort of personality or temperament or anything like that. These are chemical processes that are going on in our, inside our heads. Now, email is another set of seeking behaviors. What we're doing when we are checking our inbox is we are looking for a rewarding email, whether that is something uh, from someone that we like or that we love, whether it is uh, a reward from our boss saying, you yeah, know, well done on a project. We are seeking something. And so in that sense, email is a reward like food. Not all emails are rewarding, of course. There's quite a few emails that we get that are very unrewarding. And so because we can't tell when we're going to get a reward in our email, um, we are basically uh, suffering from the same random reinforcement schedules that the rats found so tempting. But email isn't the same as a slot machine. You know, email really isn't gambling. Um, Actually, email is worse than gambling. And the reason that I say this is because there are drivers socially pushing us to spending a lot of time in our inbox. Email is officially sanctioned. It has become the primary communications medium in business. It's also seen as a proxy for productivity. So when we were in a uh, manufacturing business and, and you could say, OK, we have produced 20 widgets in the last hour, then you know, that gives you a very good idea of counting productivity. In the knowledge worker arena, it's much harder because we don't even know anymore what we mean by work when we are doing stuff with our computer. So email is kind of a proof that we've been busy. The size of your inbox has also become related to status. So when you have that conversation with your colleagues going, oh, I got 150 emails today, there will always be someone who says, well, that's nothing. I got 300 emails. I got 500 emails. And so the volume of email that you get has become related to how important you are or how important you think you are in relationship to the people around you. That's also breeds a kind of martyr complex. People are proud of just how swamped by email they are because obviously if so many people want to communicate with them, they must be terribly important. And of course, there are drivers pushing us to send more email and particularly plausible deniability that if things go wrong with a particular project, you can always turn around and say, but didn't you see my email? And we really do love our email. Um, one study from Karen Renault at the University of Glasgow looked at how often people thought they checked their email versus how often they actually do check their email and discovered that on average, we really check our email every five minutes, even though we think we're checking it a lot less often. And of course, when email arrives in our inbox and we change our, our focus to deal with that inbox, there is a cost to that, an interrupt cost. And studies have shown it takes 64 seconds to regain your train of thought after you have been interrupted by an email. That's not counting the amount of time you spend actually answering your email. So if you put those two figures together, for the worst offenders, you're wasting eight hours a week just going, oh, what was I doing? And that's actually quite, that's quite an issue. That is a lot of time spent not actually achieving anything. So what do we do about it? Well, we could go back to you know, the primary drivers and we could say, OK, if email is like food, let's disconnect them. Let's destroy the link between behavior and reward. Well, one company that I spoke to did actually delay receipt of their corporate email by 10 minutes. It didn't take people very long to figure out that this was happening. They got very frustrated having to wait for emails they knew had been sent by their colleagues, and the company had to reverse that policy. So this isn't really going to work. We could try and remove the random aspect, 
But how do you ensure that there is always a reward in your inbox? It's virtually impossible. And if we were to say that there is never a reward, which would make us stop looking altogether, then that would basically require us to remove email altogether. Removing the reward, of course, just isn't really possible. We can't just say no more email. Although some people have um, managed to reduce their inbox down to kind of like 14 emails a week. Um, Luis Suarez at um, IBM has managed this. It isn't feasible for most people and most companies. We can remove the stimulus to check. We can shut off alerts. And that's actually really uh, one thing that I would advise you all to do right away. Um, if you have pop-up alerts or sound alerts when emails come in, get rid of that. Um, or we could uh, remove free will completely. Um, not a massive fan of the frontal lobotomy, but it might work. Um, but what I really mean by this is schedule times to check, shut email off in between. But the problem with all of these solutions is that um, they all require willpower to, uh, to some extent. You know, not checking your email, um, you know, not thinking about it in between. And email, again, there are studies that show that we actually have sorry, a limited amount of willpower. Um, once you've used up your willpower for the day resisting chocolate cake, then there's not much willpower left over for resisting email. So this is probably, you know, these, these solutions are probably not really going to work very well. Or we can learn something again from the animal kingdom and from the interaction between animals and trainers. Now this is an African crested crane, quite a large bird. Um, not the kind of bird you would like to have landing on your head. Um, but this is the problem that one American animal trainer was uh, suffering from. And of course, you can't teach animals not to do something. They don't really understand the concept of not doing something. And you don't want to actually punish animals because they don't really understand punishment either. Um, so what do you do? Well. You teach the crane to land on a mat on the ground because it can't land on the mat and on your head at the same time. And what this is called in, in psychology terms is reinforcing an alternative incompatible behavior. So when we look back at email, what are the alternative behaviors that we could reinforce? What do we do with email that we could do better somewhere else? What specific tasks can we shift away from email? Um, so one thing that we do is distribute information. And email is a very simple tool to do this for. We just create a CC list, send a bunch of stuff off to all of our colleagues. Um, but it's not a very efficient way of distributing information. Because this stuff gets lost in your inbox. Um, I'm thinking of things like department newsletters, all staff notices, team information, that kind of material that would uh, you know, that you may need at some point, but you don't need right now, and you don't need to action. And that kind of stuff works far better on a blog. Um, this is just my blog. Um, and the idea is that you know because we have you know, blogs are perfect for timestamped entries. Um, You've got a bit of discussion capability there. You've got automatic archives. Uh, you've got categories so that you can lump together things that are related. Uh, you've got tags so that you can get even more detailed in the way that you categorize stuff. Um, and this is right, really where a huge amount of business email should be going. That information should not be sitting in your inbox for that mythical day when you'll remember it's there, but it should be in one place where you know where it is, where it's searchable and findable. So this is for stuff like um, you know, an HR blog with expenses forms, a team blog for team information and updates on calls and meetings and progress. Um, we often think of blogs as, as basically being diaries, but uh, they're very basic. They're really just a content management system with comments. Um, and so we can actually use them much more flexibly than um, you see in the public domain. Another thing that we do an awful lot by email, and this one in particular uh, drives me nuts, 
is we edit documents. So we get a Word file or a PowerPoint file or whatever, and we send it around to half a dozen people and ask them to review it and edit it. And then we get half a dozen versions back and have to sit down and figure out which changes we want to keep. Um, this is quite possibly one of the most tedious ways of working known to modern man. Uh, and the wiki is a much better way of, of doing this. Um, this wiki is social text. There's a bazillion different types of wikis out there. And they just reduce the overhead for collaboration on documents. I um, had one client with a great story where uh, he and his team had to suddenly discovered they had four hours to pull together a presentation to senior management, something that uh, was quite a challenge for them. So they brainstormed everything on the wiki, they got an outline, then each person was assigned a section, they created a new page for that section, gathered all the information and data, discussed it, and then once they had what they needed in the order they needed it in, one person took that information, put it into PowerPoint, and prepared it for the presentation. In four hours, they swore blind they would never have been able to do that if they were doing it on email. Another thing that we do, asking simple questions. Um, can anyone recommend a good hotel in Malmo, for example? Um, that kind of stuff is very easy to do on something like uh, a Twitter. And if you don't want stuff in the public domain, then there's always the option of using a service like Yammer, which is basically Twitter, but focused on a particular domain name. So if uh, everyone with your company's email address signs up, then they have access only to that network. So it remains private. Um, I personally use Twitter all the time for finding information out uh, because often it's more reliable and quicker than Google. And we do, just because we are human beings and we like social stuff, we like personal recommendations over machine recommendations. So I will take a recommendation from a friend for a hotel um, over a recommendation from Google. We have conversations by email. Um, again, this is massively inefficient. I'm sure you've all been in that situation of you know, the email exchange that just won't die. Um, it's much, much easier, again, to do this sort of thing by instant messenger. The instant, interesting thing for me about instant messenger is that in business, uh, people tend to think of it as, well, that's things the young kids do. Um, whereas in actual fact, if you get into something like um, investment banking, uh, all of the traders are on their own kind of type of uh, instant messenger because it's faster for them to exchange information than by email. Um, tying it all together, really using RSS, if you're not using RSS already to keep track of uh, the different social tools that you're using, then uh, it's a good place to start. It's not just a way of tracking blogs. Uh, it's also good. Most wikis produce uh, an RSS feed of recent changes, for example. Twitter produces RSS feeds. Um, other social tools like Delicious produce RSS feeds. And having one place to bring all of that in where you can easily scan large amounts of information is uh, pretty useful. So where do you start on this? Um, well, the key thing is to know your users. Don't assume that everybody uses tools and specifically uses email the same way that you do. Watch what they do. Watch for common patterns. Um, we did some research with one client looking at different email usage patterns, and it was really quite stunning how people bent email to their will. So one person was using um, the inbox as a to-do list, so they were sending themselves emails, and the majority of their inbox was emails to themselves. Uh, one person had 50,000 unread messages. Um, they were using it to store files. Uh, in their inbox instead of on a shared drive, which from an IT perspective is pretty problematic because then you, know, you don't know where your files are and you have files duplicated over multiple inboxes. Um, there was even one person who used email to draft letters and then copied all of that into Word because she didn't like the Word interface. So what was interesting is 
from observing their behavior, you could start to see where the business tools were really falling down, what wasn't working for people. So once you understand how people work, you can also start to understand what tasks are they doing and how do those tasks work for them. Um, then once you understand your tasks, you start to shift those over to the appropriate social media. But so much of this is really about getting inside people's heads as they do their day-to-day -day job. You know, I've seen so many implementations of social media. I mean, especially in the early days of blogs where companies would go, everyone can have a blog. It'll be lovely and liberating and we can all talk to each other. And then they discover that no one would really bother because they already had enough work to do. So they didn't need something additional. So what you're really trying to achieve is trying to reduce the amount of time that people are spending uh, doing the, these tasks in an old and difficult way and make it easier, more effective, more efficient. So it's really about understanding how people do their jobs and how you can help them do their jobs more effectively. But getting back to uh, our brains and what it's like to be human. This is really all about changing habits. And I apologize for the poor pun. Um, and we have to remember that actually when we're changing people's behavior and we're creating new habits and trying to remove old habits, it's actually really difficult. If you've ever tried to you know, give up chocolate or you know, go to the gym or you know, walk your dog more often, you understand how hard it can be to change your patterns of the way that you just live your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And so understanding what triggers a particular behavior and then how you can remap that trigger onto a better new behavior becomes really important when you're trying to change the way that people work. So I spoke earlier about how um, email alerts trigger us to go and check our email and that costs us in terms of an interruption. Um, we often have other triggers that encourage us to check our email, such as, you know, first thing we do when we get into the office in the morning or the first thing we do after lunch. Um, those are the points at which we can create new habits. So instead of the first thing you do when, you're open, when you open your computer, instead of it being check your email, it may be see what's happened on the wiki. So understanding like, how our brain works in, in these terms is actually really important to successfully adopting social media. So conclusions. Email, I think, has become the tail that wags the dog. We aren't really in control of email as much as we like to think we are. And it's because of some really fundamental brain processes that we're never going to change. We are not going to get rid of dopamine, uh, and we really shouldn't try. So we need to understand what effect this happens, um, what the way that email is being used, and how we can tie all of this psychology together with sort of the behavioral lessons that we've learned and the technology to make us uh, more effective and more efficient and, uh, and basically remove the uh, eight hours that we're wasting trying to figure out what we were just doing. Um, so the images are all Creative Commons, so thank you to these lovely people. And uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>